Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the West Virginia Cybersecurity Expo and West Virginia Game Developers Expo. We have here again today Trey Balzer to do his second talk on advanced security and advanced settings you can do for your small business. How are you today, Trey? Well, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Great. Well, I'm excited to see your advanced stuff you're going to show us here. So whenever you want to share your screen, I'll go ahead and pop it up here for you. And we All can right. get started. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. So basically, this uh, presentation is going to be about securing small business a, a little bit more thorough than yesterday. Um, more towards what kind of applications, you know, open source or paid that you can use it for your environment. Um, just a little bit of a recap, since if you didn't watch yesterday's stream or anything like that, or if you just wanted to sum it all up, um, we talked about the three security controls, the physical, administrative, and technical. Um, you know, those go along with securing your environment physically, making sure everything's locked down under surveillance. Um, administrative, you have policies and procedures to follow um, and set out for end users, even like any kind of staff that you have. Um, the do's and don'ts in your environment, and then the technical aspect, which is more of the um, security fail safes, automation um, applications that, that help you uh, get to know your network, get to secure it, make sure that everything's up to date, uh, make sure that no intruders, intrusions or anything of the sorts happens. Um, then we talked about knowing your network, and that's kind of getting to know what kind of devices that you are hosting, um, whether they are devices that you know about or you have yet to see. So definitely want to do scanning and any kind of like um, walkthroughs of your environment to make sure that everything on your network is what it's supposed to be and nothing crazy or, or just random showing up and, and leading to possible compromise, compromises. Um, and then we talked about um, what you do after you do the scanning and, and creating topologies and knowing your network. Um, so you take those findings and you kind of um, continue to monitor those endpoints and making sure that they are consistently up. There's no weird um, uh, traffic getting generated from these hosts. Um, setting a baseline, making sure that you know what's exactly happening on your network, and then securing those devices, like making sure that they're locked down, um, kind of keep them up to date, upgraded, um, fully patched, making sure that there's no known vulnerabilities, uh, making sure that those devices have applications scanning for viruses, malware um, of the sorts. So the additional security methods that I kind of want to go over today, um, and a lot of these are going to, you know, start to acquire a cost or a price with them. Um, but that's the email security appliance, web filtering, DNS filtering, and backups. So the first thing is the email security appliance. This kind of acts as like a, the firewall in front of your email server. It kind of blocks um, sending in forward or sending and receiving emails, making sure that they're getting stopped at the gate, scanned to make sure that there's no kind of viruses or any kind of malware um, attached to those emails. Um, you know, it can also go into spam filtering if, the, if they have certain criteria on that email that they don't um, completely follow, like having an unsubscribe button down at the bottom, that might be a red flag um, for these filters. Um, it can also scan and make sure that, you know, no private or sensitive information is shared from outside of the company. So, um, you know, inside the company going out, like uh, social security numbers of employees or any kind of payroll information, it, it kind of scans and makes sure that those keywords, if there's affiliation to them, um, it might throw it into a quarantine zone until you go in and approve it manually. Um, that way, if phishing attempts uh, or scam emails do go through and you, an end user accidentally puts in their credentials and tries to send their information, it might stop you at the door. Um, it also help and make sure that, you know, attachments on your devices are, um, or sorry, attachments on those emails don't have a, a malicious payload of any sorts. It'll take it and scan it. It'll make sure those hyperlinks um, are scanned before you can click on them. They'll actually rip and replace 
the original hyperlink with an approved um, security appliance um, hyperlink. So this one is a Barracuda uh, spam firewall. So it'll actually replace that link with a Barracuda email or web link. Um, so this is the Exchange Admin Center for Office 365. Um, if you don't have the the um, the funds to, to justify a email filter uh, piece of hardware or application outside of your normal email system, um, Office 365, if you go that route or have already been on there, you actually have a built-in uh, malware filter, connection filter, and content filter. Um, so you can kind of tweak those settings that, you know, increase the priority, um, the sensitivity to from low, medium to high, or, and try to like fine tune it to what best fits your uh, environment. So there are different ways to do it. Um, some cost more. Having an on-site appliance is definitely going to be the more expensive cost. But if you're already paying for the Office 365 Exchange, there is a content filter built in. And uh, Patrick will probably be able to explain a lot more on that kind of stuff, um, where he knows Exchange a lot better than I. But um, so web filtering is the next kind of um, security device that you or uh, fail safe that you can put into place. This kind of prevents websites from being navigated to if they're known to be, um, you know, malicious or if they had a lot of advertisements or if you just wanted to restrict those kinds of content from your environment. So, um, for instance, you might not want every user in your environment to be able to reach out and connect to social media or like Facebook, because um, a lot of times there's ads on those websites that they click and they can download potentially unwanted programs and uh, can lead to compromising your entire environment. So unless you're a certain employee that does the social networking for your company, there might not be a need for it. So using a web filter to lock that kind of content um, will actually help you in the long run. You can create users and groups over, like for instance, on the web security gateway of a Barracuda device, um, the users and groups tab, you can create certain exceptions for users or um, create custom groups based on like sort of like your Active Directory environment. So if you have a marketing team, you can put users in the marketing group and then they will have access to certain like websites. Hey, Trey. Uh -huh. I'll throw out there. I, I was waiting. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. But I was waiting for a good point there when you mentioned the uh, uh, the exchange. I like the fact that an exchange, uh, it can go twofold. Um, with, with your exchange and your content filter, you can actually decide to filter in to keep out spam. But on the flip side, you can also do filtering with transport rules to stop data leakage because like maybe you don't want emails that come in that mention free cash or you know some sort of enlarger or viagra but on the flip side if you're working on a program and it's called project x you can go ahead and check to see if someone's sending out content that is like project x or whatever and make sure that we stop that from going out so i kind of like it from a you know from two sides of the fence, make sure your internal people <coughs> aren't trying to do corporate espionage. Make sure outside people aren't able to, to, to pull one over on your internal people, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it definitely helps to be able to lock down that kind of system uh, or emails out. So it definitely helps to make sure that the privacy of your employees are well kept too. Um, in case, you know, a phishing attempt is targeted towards someone in HR or um, human relations, the uh, the confidential information out, say like an employee's social security number, thinking it's someone who's their boss, um, it'll actually flag that and quarantine it and then notify the end user and, and maybe the IT administrator. But, um, and then the last thing for web filtering, uh, you can kind of have like a uh, equal eye view of what actually websites the end users are kind of going to. So you can see uh, timestamps and, and when exactly someone is actually going to those locations. Um, so for instance, this one, they, someone was trying to go to Pinterest and it was blocked based on a user defined blacklist, or you can do categories such as like social networking, pornography, um, gun shows, like, it just depends on the keywords. You can restrict it down. 
Uh, we're going along with web filtering. There's also DNS filtering. Um, this gets applied at the DNS server level. Uh, so either your endpoint or your DNS server points to these virtual machines or physical devices, and they will actually filter out um, DNS entries or queries based on whitelists and blacklists and different kinds of policies. So you can kind of do the same exact thing as a web filter. Um, but in my opinion, DNS filtering can go hand in hand with it. You, I recommend having both um, for the extra layer of security, but this will actually let you be able to adjust devices um, outside of your network as well, because Cisco Umbrella targets uh, people that you know, if they disable their VPN and they try to reach out to an, a website on their home network, they can actually have these settings hard coded in. So they have to go through the DNS filter. So it kind of helps prevent malware um, from magically showing up on your devices. Um, so the two that I most commonly know, um, one Cisco umbrella which is more of the, the business environment. And then if you want to kind of go towards DNS filtering for a home environment, I recommend Pi-hole. It's, you know, open sourced and you can download it and install it on a VM. You can install it on your home computer. You can have a Raspberry Pi. Um, those are, it's great ways to kind of get rid of advertising and making sure that you don't accidentally click on links that'll take you to uh, known websites that are bad. And then we have backups, which at first glance, you know, backups aren't necessarily security oriented. You don't think about it being something that can help uh, harden your environment, but there's a couple reasons why I put that in there. The first reason is just making sure that you have business continuity. If your environment was to be compromised or say a computer were to go down, uh, sorry, if a server were to go down due to malicious reasons, you can possibly roll back and install a, or recreate it with a backup. Um, oftentimes you'll see in environments that back, like your actual servers are compromised by ransomware, your files will get encrypted and you have to pay a key or pay for a key to unlock that um, encryption. So having a backup that has uh, ransomware protection will actually help save a lot of your data um, and, and save you from having to pay those high costs for the key. If they even give you the key after they pay, um, oftentimes they might not even give you a key, but it will definitely help you, um, especially if you have a lot of sensitive information on, on a file server or email server that you can't go without. Um, if, cause it could completely cripple your company if you don't have proper backups. So in a sense, it's kind of securing the, the livelihood of your your company. So there's a couple different ways you can do backups and you have the on-premise, off-premise, and then hybrid. Um, you can have a mixture of a couple of different ways. If you have a physical backup appliance installed in like your data closets um, and have your servers back up to that, oftentimes they'll back up to the cloud. So you kind of have the on-prem and off-prem Sometimes you just feel comfortable enough to like have it all completely on premise. So you like just back up to Synology NAS or something. Um, I definitely recommend having either, definitely recommend having on premise because that's when you can restore your, your uh, servers or workstations or whatever you have backed up at a timely manner. You don't have to worry about bandwidth and stuff like that. But then also if that, if that location gets down, you, you want to have like an offsite um, backup location. So you can either do that with the cloud, which a lot of uh, Microsoft Office 365, um, Barracuda, Cisco, there's there's different ways that you can have them back up onto the cloud and have that hybrid situation. Or if you have a multiple location like company where you have more than one data center, you can kind of have the backups replicate from one location to the other and vice versa. So that way, if one data center goes down, you can restore it from the other one.
so some additional tools for security. And this is kind of going towards what we talked about yesterday with like uh, getting to know your network scanning, advanced IP scanner and in-map. Um, this is kind of going to go a little bit more in depth. Um, might take some extra Googling or research before you're using these tools. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, OpenVOS vulnerability scanner. These are vulnerability scanners are basically thing or devices or um, applications that scan your entire environment and go off of like your application versions or your operating systems or port configurations and see what exactly is vulnerable in your environment. You know, it's not 100% foolproof. There's some things that the vulnerability scanner might miss, but it will definitely flag and show you what exactly is like high priority things that you might want to get um, resolved in a timely manner. You know, they, they, they summarize it based on the different levels of severity. So high, medium or low, um, you know, low risk items you don't necessarily have to deal with right away. You can plan for it in the future. You have some time. Um, if you feel like that is something you want to target, you know, you can go for it. But the, most of the time you want to target the more high or more towards the medium scale. Those two um, criteria or severity levels based on, well, you know, if there's a brute force login uh, vulnerability and it's really high, then the chances of it being exploited is going to be very much larger compared to, um, you know, something on the low scale. Um, OpenVOS and other vulnerability scanners will actually generate reports. So if you are doing this for a small business or even as a managed service provider, you can use these devices and scan um, the network and generate a report and hand them to you know business holders or, or stakeholders that have authority to say, hey, we might want to spend some extra money to address this. So it's very nice to have. Um, you can actually brand some of these reports with your logos and company um, attire. So that way it looks, you know, fancy and official. Then, you know, pr you can present it to your higher ups and say, hey, there is these vulnerabilities. The only way I can patch it or get rid of it is if I either turn it off or buy a new one. Um, so it might rec or it might give you that kind of proof that something is wrong in your environment and you actually get the... Uh, the means or the pay to, to make a difference. It'll, uh, I also want to say that like, it'll also point out like what hosts are vulnerable. Um, so you can look into it from a host standpoint or a network environment, um, make sure that like those endpoints themselves are secured. So if you find that you still have a windows XP or heck even a windows seven device now, you can easily see this in those host summaries or um, vulnerability reports and easily target those and make sure that, you know, it might not be tomorrow that those get replaced, but they should be on your roadmap to get, get out of the network. Um, so OpenVOS was a, an open sourced vulnerability scanner. Nessus is more of a, uh, you know, closed environment. It's kind of paid for, for, all of it you get i think you can get like a free trial it can scan so many nodes but um it just kind of does the same thing as open boss but probably a little bit more pretty cat has a little bit more of an administrative portal that you can um adjust and, and fine tune and it'll it just depends on what your preference is you might have to try both of them before you make a settle or you might run both of them because there might be a chance that OpenVOS or Nessus uh, missed something and the other one will pick it up. Same with antivirus. You want to have a couple different versions of something um, or different kinds of applications to kind of pick up where one slacks. So this one kind of shows that, you know, this one has the optical um, severity and high, medium, and then just the informational one. Um, sometimes it'll just show uh, things that you might not have known about your network. You know, you, you might not known that a workstation was handing out DHCP IP addresses. Um, or if something had the DNS service installed and it's running, but you didn't necessarily think that had that, um, or it, that workstation might just not need that service going. So kind of like InMap, like, or uh, yeah, InMap yesterday or ZenMap, 
Um, it kind of shows you some of the services or ports that will be running in the background that you kind of just take for granted or you just don't, not every day you look into your services and see if that um, application is running. So uh, these vulnerability scanners are a pretty good tool to see what's on your network. You can kind of see what's vulnerable in your network um, and what things that you might want to address later on. Another thing to see exactly what's going on, and this is a, a really common tool used by network administrators, is Wireshark. Um, you can put your wireless NIC in your laptop in promiscuous mode and kind of see exactly what kind of traffic is going over the wire or over wireless um, and see if there is like snooping attacks or kind of like any kind of port scanning going on if your wireless network or your even your wired network um, is running slow for some reason and you think there's a lot of traffic being generated by something um, you know firing up wireshark will let you see it you can actually see all seven layers of the osi model inside of the packet so you can kind of see and, and get accustomed to seeing um, how exactly a packet goes up or down through the osi layers uh, you can see what kind of um, protocol it's using. So this on the left hand side, transmission control protocol. Um, so it's using TCP and it's showing you that it's going through the source port. So that's 443. So that by default, you know, that's going to be HTTPS. Um, and then it'll show you the destination port. You can show you the source IP or the destination IP address. Um, you know, the destination one looks like it's an internal IP address. So that packet in particular is coming from an outside source. So um, you can investigate that way. Um, there's a lot of noise when it comes to it. So there's a filter bar at the top. You know, you can try to filter by host or filter by protocol um, or a couple different ways to do it. You can kind of follow the data stream and see exactly what kind of website someone is navigating to and it'll pull up and kind of show you exactly what they see. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, it's a good way to see if port scanning is involved or any other kind of network attack that's going on. Um, again, there's a lot of noise, so it, it takes a little bit of a, a, a learning curve to, to get used to it and be able to handle it. And um, there's plenty of YouTube videos, and, and you can Google it out. Um, there's plenty of walkthroughs on how to exactly navigate Wireshark and making sure that you're using it to its fullest. Durbuster, um, so web applications or web servers are one of the most targeted um, forms of applications in an environment because it's oftentimes the one that is left most vulnerable and it's also the one that is public facing most of the time. Um, so Durbuster, what it does is it's kind of brute forcing those web directories on your network or on that server to see if there is a public facing folder or directory that you can possibly jump into and compromise or pull information from. There might be a login portal that no one knew about that was uh, just sitting there on the network and just from plainly looking at it, you might not have seen it. Um, a lot of exploits start out with Durbuster, so or web application brute forcing. Um, so Durbuster is pretty powerful. Um, it uses the get requests and head requests um, to kind of see exactly what all um, directories are listed on your web server. You might think that you only have a login portal sitting on there, but you might actually show a private um, file server or file folder that has credentials stored in them um, in plain text. So that could easily lead to being compromised or, or having your entire environment um, perpetrated by an attacker or um, someone who, well, I guess anyone who's trying to penetrate your network is an attacker, but it could also be something that from an IT administrator standpoint, you can use to see what directories you have showing and why they're showing. So you can kind of look into it and see if you need to make sure that they're hidden or more locked down. Each ping, um, it's a pretty cool, uh, utility. It's built into Kali Linux and you can install it uh, manually as well. It, it's kind of just like a regular ping, 
um, utility. So you try to ping a node or an IP address and it'll tell you whether or not you have it or if it's responding to ICMP packets. And if it doesn't and you think that device is on and you're pretty confident about it, you can actually change up the type of packet that gets sent. So in this example, there is a UDP flag that kind of changes the ICMP over to UDP instead of trying to use the traditional ping is trying to use a UDP packet. You can also do TCP and I think one other one. Um, so you can try to hit that host and see if it'll respond to a different form of packet because the firewall might not allow ICMP packets to go through. Um, sort of like Nmap, um, it has the utility when you, you go to port scan, you can change it up and change to different protocols, um, different types of scans that will actually see if those nodes are still on there or if they were just kind of being filtered out by a firewall. Um, from those who kind of want to go into the penetration track or anything like that, this utility actually has a spoof. Um, ability. So this is where you can spoof your IP address and kind of make it look like you're coming from a different workstation. So if your IP address is .10, you can kind of change it to 1 .150. So it's going kind to of be a little bit harder to track down and see who it actually is coming from. So the next thing is uh, Snort, which is a command line. Um, application that you can install on Windows, Linux, um, I think even Macintosh. It's a network intrusion detection system. It's open sourced and everything. So you can click this and, and have it run on certain time scales or just have it run in the background on a server. And this is basically to see if there is malicious payloads or any kind of weird traffic going through um, your network and see exactly what kind of devices are showing up. It where it's command line based, it's a little bit more hard to, or more difficult to interpret. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there as well. Just like Wireshark, you're going to probably want to do some research and see what exactly, what all you can do with this. Um, a lot of times you can have it, or for Snort, you can export it out to a text document and see, um, you know, after the fact, you can pull up those text documents and look for any kind of patterns. Um, and this is just an open source application or one of those things that you don't have to really pay for right away. So it, it might be good to get used to this and then kind of, you know, see if you justify buying an actual app like a firewall that has a built in network intrusion detection system. So or like an um, ASA firepower and stuff like that. So if you're interested in more security tools, um, I don't even think I kind of brushed the surface of what is actually out there. You know, Kali Linux has a bunch of different built-in applications or utilities that you can use, experiment with. It might pertain to you, it might not. Um, it just depends on what kind of environment you are doing and what kind of environment that as an IT administrator that you're supporting. So, you know, you might not have the authority to run these different types of scans. So you might want to reach out and see what all you can or cannot do. So make sure if you do any kind of scanning that you want to get permission from, you know, your superiors or, or um, business holders and stuff like that. You don't want to do a vulnerability scan without someone's consent um, because that's when you get into that legal uh, territory where you could probably get charged or something like that. Because from the outside standpoint, if you just run a vulnerability scanner on someone's network without their consent, you're basically trying to find a vulnerability, which is in the legal eyes, um, you're attacking someone's environment. So if you're interested in more, more security tools, I definitely recommend learning Linux. Um, it is kind of like the gateway drug to command line and, and getting to be more familiar with um, workstations, operating systems, servers, anything like that. It's kind of more bare bones, so you kind of see the actual file structure and everything come to life there. You know, there are uh, graphical user interfaces for most Linux operating systems. You can get it bare bones where it's just command line, but you definitely can do um, the graphical user interface and kind of get accustomed to it and slowly, you know, transition over into the terminal. Um, so from the left side, uh, we have Linux Mint, which is going to be the operating system closest to Windows, but it's still going to be Linux. 
Um, then you have Ubuntu, Paired Operating System, and Kali. If you're in the penetration track or you kind of want to do more cybersecurity related things, I definitely recommend Kali, um, especially because it, it does have those tools already built in. You can get the same tools on any of these um, operating systems, but Kali kind of goes for the whole, all the tools are in your pocket already, go for it. Definitely recommend doing that. If you don't know where to get started really on learning Linux, you know, you can YouTube your way through it, install whichever version of off or, um, whichever version of Linux that you want. Um, there might be some that you think that you like, so you can install them on virtual machines. You know, VirtualBox is a free virtualization application um, that a lot of people use to start out. And, or you can get VMware Workstation or, or VMware Fusion if you're a, a Macintosh user. If, and then if you, if you don't know where to get started after you have your virtual machine or have your device that's Linux. These are some of the websites I recommend. So overthewire.org is kind of like a capture the flag um, for beginners. It kind of has a couple different um, tracks that you can do. The bandit version of over the wire is the one that you kind of learn the basic Linux commands to get you SSH or remotely connected to a, a machine kind of use the readme files and stuff to see, you know, kind of navigate the, the Linux terminal structure. And then uh, once you get going with that, um, of course, if you ever get stuck, there's walkthroughs and stuff, but I definitely recommend doing your homework um, before you give up and try to just look at the answer. Tryhackme.com is another good one. This one is a website. It's There's a free version and a paid version. If you use the paid version, it's like $10 a month or $30 uh, every three months. And um, you can actually have a Kali virtual machine that is hosted on TryHackMe, so you don't even have to have a virtual machine installed on your device. Um, it kind of goes through the educational track. It'll teach you exactly how to do like web application enumerations and... Um, any kind of in-map scans, or I know there's a course on that, some PowerShell stuff. So it's not necessarily all Linux, but it, it, it tries to make sure that you're coming in uh, well prepared for the different types of app or uh, operating systems you'll run into. Um, it kind of does the, uh, it'll break down like a simple uh, step into like five or six steps and have hints in case you get stuck. And then you type in the answers or whatever your findings are and it'll say if it was correct or or not correct. So TryHackMe is a, a pretty good website to get started on. Once you get to the more intermediate level and you want to try a little bit more challenging, and sometimes these things are very difficult, um, you can go to Hack the Box, which is hosted in Europe, which is why there's the .eu, which you don't really see every day. Um, they're about $10 a month in US currency. And you basically try to hack into these boxes um, or the virtual machines that they host. And they're kind of like giant puzzles that have um, capture the flag part components of it. And you just try to get um, a user flag or user password to, to try to spin off and, and get the root or administrator password. Um, and then there's a big community that you can reach out to, ask for help and everything like that. So those are three websites that are really good to get started. The, the costs aren't nearly as much. Um, a cloudguru.com. It's actually uh, an educational website that, that kind of focuses on training you more about cloud applications. It used to be called Linux Academy, but since they started doing more um, AWS and Azure, rolled into it with Linux. Um, they kind of, I guess, went in with a merger and merged with a cloud guru. So um, it's about $50 a month unless they raised it or lowered it um, since I did it. There is a lot of different videos that you can watch, a lot of different training stuff. You have in a lab environment that you can have your own um, Linux virtual machine hosted in the cloud, just like um, Try Hack Me. So those are some good websites to get started. It's there's no set way on how to get started. So don't feel that intimidated. There's plenty of things that you can do. You can just watch YouTube videos until you get comfortable. It just depends on what you want to do, how you want to apply it to your everyday life. Um, 
Linux isn't for everyone. So if if you start doing it and you don't like it, I mean, there's no reason that you have to keep going. Or um, if you think that it doesn't really apply to you because you're an IT administrator or if you're just on the help desk or whatever, um, I definitely think you should consider it um, because a lot of times it'll make you feel more comfortable um, doing more commands or, or getting more on the back end side of things, even in Windows. Um, just knowing how the operating system works and how the, the file structures are held together. Um, you'll see a lot of differences between the two. You'll see a lot of compatibilities and incompatibilities. Um, so it's just something that you can explore and it, it's a, a great hobby to do. So a lot of cybersecurity conferences or, or um, conferences in general that pertain to IT, they'll usually have a capture the flag um, event hosted. So that way they can uh, have like kind of like a mini game or a fun little thing that people can test their skills and see what all they can do. And, you know, you get those bragging rights if you start winning. After all that, um, back to the DNS filtering part of it, I just kind of wanted to do a quick rundown on, uh, you know, installing Pi-hole and getting it up and running in your environment and just kind of seeing what all it can do a little bit. Um, so I will go ahead and push play because I felt like I was going to screw it up or something. So I recorded it. <laughs> so uh, basically, if a fresh version of Ubuntu was installed as a virtual machine, um, I had to install curl, which is basically something that you can um, use to download stuff from websites and everything like that. So running that first command installed the application curl for me so I can and go out and reach to the Pi-hole website and download the, the files or installer for it. Um, I kind of made a typo in here on purpose. The L um, was lowercase when I first tried to run it. It is cap sensitive, so I just kind of want to show if you had some issues with that, that you want to make sure that, you know, um, that you just be careful about syntax. It's really easy to make a typo or do a lowercase instead of a capital letter. And that can actually screw up your uh, program or give you a lot of headache later on. So just kind of want to show what would happen if you did that typo. Um, so that command, um, so I used the curl command and reached out to that website to download the installation files for Pi-hole and it'll actually go ahead and start trying to run it. I used sudo in front of it to just tell the terminal or a command line that I'm going to use admin rights to install this device. Instead of like right clicking and run as admin in Windows, you have the sudo command. You get a nice little graphic kind of shows the Raspberry Pi logo um, or the Pi hole version of it. And then this will go out and install all the packages and different uh, dependencies that you need for your environment. So it'll install like DHCP server, um, DNS utilities, and stuff like that. Um, so the whole point of this is just to kind of get the uh, Pi hole um, connecting to it. But uh, kind of having the um, advertisements on your network getting filtered out and uh, locked. So it's definitely something, a, a great utility to use later on. Um, really easy to set up. It does require a static IP address, so you want to make sure you have that. The upstream DNS provider, this is where it kind of pulls like what um, your DNS server is. A lot of people use the Google DNS server or the Open DNS. Um, both are free. All those were free um, that you kind of point your device to. After, like, so your, your endpoints are going to connect to that, then it's going to connect out to the public DNS servers. Then you kind of have a list of um, which kind of versions you have, or like what kind of blacklists, whitelists that you want to pull from. You do have to have a static IP address. So um, for this instance, I just used whatever static IP address it wanted to give me. So I didn't really care. But in an environment, you might want to set that up and make it sure that it's what you wanted to do. Um, do you want to install the web admin inter interface? This is where you can control everything from an admin um, perspective. You can see everything. Um, you can have the web server hosted on the virtual machine, or you can separate it and run it on something else that's using a web server. You don't necessarily have to go through them. 
I turned on logs just in case you had any issues. You can go back through that. Privacy mode, there's five options, zero through four. Um, zero showing everything, four is disabled, so you can't really see anything. Um, if you're doing a home environment, you might want to do the disabled statistics part or anonymous mode because not every day do you want to see what your dad's doing at two in the morning. Um, so it just depends on what you're doing. If it's an IT environment, you know, you might want to crank it on so you can see exactly what websites um, users are going to. There's going to be a lot of noise, so it just kind of depends on how you want to filter it out or how you want to do it. Uh, so that's basically installing. And uh, while that does that, I just want to say if or the way this is set up, you can either have your endpoints or workstations point directly to this DNS server, or you can put whatever you, um, your current DNS server is and point it to this one. So, uh, for instance, in my home environment, I could run this and point my Linksys router and connect it directly to that. So after the installation is complete, it'll give you a little bit of information on how it's configured. Um, it did use IPv4. I didn't want to do IPv6 yet because um, just to keep it simple. The install log to make sure everything installed correctly showed into that folder directory. Um, the interface, there's a couple of different ways you can do. You can do pi.hole um, forward slash admin or go off the IP address forward slash admin. And there's also the local host ability. Um, I believe I did that in this setup. It also gives you a generic password that it auto generated. Um, so there's ways to change it. You might have to Google it because I'm pretty sure that you have to go through the terminal to change the admin password going through. Um, so I just kept it kind of the default to see what exactly um, how we wanted to do it. So I did do local host. So that'll tell it to go off of the machine that it's currently on. Um, so this is the admin console or it's kind of the console before the admin console because at first you have to log in. Um, you can kind of see the basics like your host name, which is Ubuntu. You can see, um, you know, how many queries or any kind of queries that are blocked. You can see a statistic of how much, like what percentage of them were blocked versus how many were approved. Um, you can see how big your domain blacklist is. Some of them are in the thousands, some of them are in the millions. It just depends on how many blacklists that you want to add to your environment. So um, after authenticating and logging in, you kind of see a little bit more on the left-hand side than you did before. Um, you have the query log that you can go in and see exactly you know, what's getting allowed, what's getting denied. You can filter it out and see or search for certain domains. They have uh, timestamps on it. Then there's a couple different things. Um, you can do the whitelist, which is going to be where you approve a domain on your network. So if you want ads to show on a certain website for whatever reason you have, um, you can go ahead and add those domains in. Sometimes if it has a video or you're trying to go to like a news article, it'll detect that an ad's getting blocked. So you might have to whitelist it. Um, so for instance, on this one, I did Netacad, which is the Cisco ne Network Academy. And if for a school environment, if they wanted to show ads, you could just put in a description saying for school, you'll get a success message or an error message. Um, you can enable it temporarily, or you can go into uh, the action and just hit delete and, and get rid of it. There's the blacklist management. So that's the same thing as the whitelist, but this is making sure that things are not coming through. So if a website somehow gets through your blacklist that you have generated, you can go ahead and add it specifically. Group management, sort of like uh, the web filter. Um, you can have clients or groups that are have either a whitelist or a different kind of blacklist that target them specifically. So, you know, marketing, if they get on social networking, they can have ads shown for them. Um, you can easily disable or enable those groups just as much as the, um, the blacklist or the whitelist. You can put in descriptions or even delete them. So it, it's definitely a powerful tool as well that you can use. So same with client. You can have client groups and have known clients added in um, and do the same exact kind of group assignment that you have. This is where you have the workstations that you want and you can throw them into those groups. 
So you can also, if you want to troubleshoot or have, or you're having issues, you can disable it. Um, 10, 30 seconds, five minutes or a custom time. You can set it to, I believe those are in minutes. Um, so you can set up to 60 minutes. Then you have some tools to see like what kind of logs you have. The tail fit, the tail pie hole uh, file will get generated if there's any kind of errors with the service or with the application itself. And then you can also go into your settings and look at the network information that you have, what kind of IP address you have, um, the user group, your CPU usage on that device, um, the DNS cache that you have. You can go to the ad lists that you can generate, um, go into like group management. DNS, you can add more DNS servers or adjust them if you need to. You can add your own custom DNS servers. So this is where you could probably, um, if you want to do an internal DNS server as well, that's how you could do it that way. Um, it does do additional utilities like DNS uh, sec and a couple other things. Um, deals with con conditional forwarding, etc. So you can also make your pie hole into a DHCP server. So it can be handing out IP addresses and filtering DNS. So you don't have to have two different devices for it. So if you wanted to take off some of the bandwidth or the load on your router at home, um, this would be a good utility to have because you can take away the DHCP and have it all ran with your DNS server. Um, then you have some API settings that you can do to do some uh, application uh, calls, stuff like that. You can back up your device or restore it from a backup file. So it definitely has the same mentality of like a server in a sense. You can definitely back it up and make sure that if it, if it were to go down or if you want to get a new one, you can import those files back in. You can go in and see like network overview, like which devices are actively using the Pi Hole um, DNS filter. And then you can kind of go in and test it. Um, when I did the walkthrough for this, I made a really big mistake, as in I didn't target the device to point to the DNS server. So I was trying to see exactly why or what was showing. Um, there was some websites that got blocked that I guess it was just reaching out to Google for whatever reason. And so it got blocked and it threw into gravity, which is really um, like a, a black hole or the null um, it just kind of goes off the nowhere. So you can whitelist that if you're having issues with it getting blocked, um, or you can blacklist it if it's not getting blocked. So it'll actually show um, the whitelist entry after you hit it, and you can remove it if you made a mistake or anything like that. Um, so after that, I kind of wanted to show... Um, so I did fix my mistake by going up into, uh, no, let me start the VM that maybe. Okay, so I did make the mistake of not pointing my device um, to the DNS server. So from the graphical user way, um, you can go up to the top and go to wired connected. And this is for Ubuntu. It might be different for other Linux flavors um, and clicked on wired settings. And then on my wired NIC, I went ahead and looked at the settings there. This is where you can see the IP address, the IPv6 address for your virtual machine or your actual machine, depending on how you want to do it. Um, so if you go over to, let's see, it's under details for IPv4. And then under the DNS section, you can put in your own IP address because you're the server that's being ran. Um, and then the way you can reach out to the public DNS servers is by going through the pie hole or this device because it's already pointing to like open, open DNS or Google or however you had it set up. So after you set that in, you just hit apply and then the change kind of gets made uh, instantly. So now um, with pie hole not running, going to test your ad blocker ads hyphen blocker.com, you can kind of see that there's ads showing and this is with pie hole not running so if you wanted to make sure that users didn't click random ads you can run the pie hole so going over to enable which this is 
normally on disable. It's that one that's had indefinitely or for 10 seconds, 30 seconds or whatever. I might have timed out. There we go. Okay, so it's enabled. And now all we have to do is refresh the page. And now there's no ads showing up. So it kind of just rips them out of the website. There might be a white space or it'll just cut out the, the little section completely. So if we disable that um, indefinitely again and refresh the page again, those ads are back. Um, so it's, it's really easy to stop it and uh, kind of let you troubleshoot and figure out what exactly is happening. Um, if you notice, the, the total queries kind of filled up a little bit more. So um, timestamps, the Google ads that are going through, um, these are all the ones that are being allowed. And mainly because it, the, the pie hole was disabled. So if you had any more that you wanted to stop, you could try to find it and then just go ahead and hit blacklist. Then it'll add it to the blacklist. You can go in and edit and make sure that that's what you want to do. There's a couple different options you can do. You can add a comment on why you why you blacklist it. By default, if you add it through the query log, it'll just add that little header that's saying add it from query log. Um, so you can always put like website bad and that'll somehow jog your memory. But so there's a lot of different things you can do with it. Um, you get these little graphical charts that shows you the queries over the last 24 hours, client activity. Um, that'll be kind of good with, like I said yesterday, if, if a device is handing out or looking out to the internet at two in the morning a lot, that might be a signify or like to signify that, you know, there might be something going on there. So you might want to investigate. <clears throat> then uh, there's the queries answered by um, the resolver open DNS. This one is by a cache, which is the, there's a type of, cache or block list or a couple of things that gets installed based on whatever um, blacklist you used. And that'll be the reason why something gets queried. The more blacklists you have, the more chances of things getting blocked, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. You kind of want to make sure that um, it's not just going out there. Um, so yeah, that's kind of everything I wanted to show on this part. Um, you can see the domains that you have on your block list. Um, there's a, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. Um, I definitely recommend it for your home environment more than anything, but you can definitely use it as a free open source way to do it in your, your business environment. Um, but all right, well, that kind of sums up everything for me. You still with us, Patrick? Hey, Scott. I, I don't believe he is. <laughs> I think he left us. Uh, yeah. He, I think he had to duck out for a minute. Um, so could you tell us a little bit, how, how did you actually get into the, uh, the, the Linux side of things? Um, a, lot, a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. are unfamiliar or uh, gun shy of Linux, you know, because it's, it's tough to use sometimes. It's, it's a very intimidating tool. Um, you know, my beginning was kind of in Cisco networking when I was in high school. So I had the command line confident, like I felt comfortable in command line because of that. Yeah. Uh, from the iOS. Yeah. Um, I'm a big, like do it by the command line way. Um, yeah. Over time, you know, I went through Mount West and, and stuff like that. And I learned um, PowerShell and command prompt and um, those kind of things that you can use. And it kind of goes hand in hand with Linux, but I never really, brushed the surface until I, I was a knock engineer for a managed service provider. And that's where I kind of needed to use um, Linux skills to troubleshoot if there was a, a Linux server or if, um, if something went wrong, like the host file or something on a Linux device was changed. I had to kind of Google my way through it every time. And then um, yeah. one of my coworkers uh, showed me, you know, what all he can do with Linux and he started like when his laptop went down, um, he replaced the hard drive and just installed straight up Linux and just ran with it. 
So um, there was a lot of hurdles. I did the same thing with my laptop after a while. Um, a lot of hurdles um, trying to figure out like how to do it compared to Windows. So um, yeah, a lot of it was fun because there is a game mentality that you can do, um, which is like capture the flag events. Those are kind uh -huh. of things that you can do. Like, it's like if you really want to do technical puzzles, that's kind of the way you can do it. Um, if you want to get more skills or, or tools under your belt, like if you're a, a network administrator and you want to get more accustomed to how your network actually operates, it's a good way to to get like you know download Kali and, and use some of the built-in tools to see exactly what's happening on your network. Oh yeah. I, uh, when we were doing the, our fast track program, I, I taught, uh, five of the five MCSA courses in one semester. And so everybody went through, you know, five MCSA courses in, in one semester and they were going, going in one day or once every day. So they were in there four days a week. And, um, I, I had gone through, you know, all the security and stuff like that on, on windows and, you know, um, permissions, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, all in group policy and how you can lock down the desktop mm -hmm. and, and things that you couldn't, couldn't do and all that stuff. And so then I said, well, take a look at this. And so I fired up a Cali Linux live CD and um, I had shown them how we couldn't browse much of the network and stuff on windows. And then I fired up Kali Linux and I just started browsing everything. And I said, oh yeah, if you actually want to get to these NTFS files that you don't have permissions to, here you go. You know, and I, I couldn't believe it. They, they were, um, I, I had one guy say, well, wait a minute. You know, he, he was like, I, you just showed us all this security stuff, right? And now you're showing us that, that it's not any good. And I said, well, you know, you need to know. And um, I said, if your entire environment is is Windows, sure, they're they're really getting good about security and trying to lock things down. But I said, you know, it's not always going to be Windows users. And, um, you know, most of your threat actors, the bad folks are using Linux. And um, a lot of the tools are written in Linux. And so, you know, <laughs> it was funny, though, just the reaction. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely recommend if, um, you know, you're not familiar with Linux or even Mac. I mean, if to make a good IT administrator or a good technician, um, getting that exposure, whether it's even in a small scale or if you want to primarily focus in that, it's a good way to get um, better skills and better ways to look at things from either a security perspective or even like a troubleshooting perspective. Um, you know, sure. I, I wasn't familiar with Linux, so I went out and I, I grabbed a device and I installed Linux on it and I I played around with it. I tinkered with it. Um, I wasn't familiar with Macintosh at, or, uh, you know, having a MacBook at all. So I went out and bought one just to straight up learn the OS, because a lot of times you will run into it where, say, you're in an interview and there's two people. One person knows windows really well and then there's one person that knows all three applic or all three operating systems or a variety of them really well that person will be looked at a yeah. lot so. yeah um i i know for a while i taught at ohio university um between uh stints at, at mctc because i had taught when we were over at marshall's campus for um uh, about 10 years and then I taught at OU for five years and then I came back. But um, we at, at Ohio University, I was the IT director and, and uh, we had Mac, you know, machines uh, in a, a student lounge area. And, and so I said, okay, I, I had never, you know, I'd worked with like the original Mac, you mm -hmm. know, way back in the day. And so I said, okay, put one of those on my desk and, and I'm going to go ahead and, and try to get you know used to this. But I tell you what, I was on the phone with Patrick I, every time I turned around because it was almost like having a virus. I mean, everything I tried to do didn't make sense to me. I, I really don't have the, uh, the Mac mentality. I just don't. And, yeah. um, and you know, Mac people are like, well, 
you're practically born knowing how to use a Mac. I mean, it's, it's not a problem, you know, but everything, every time I tried to do something, it, it didn't make sense to me, you know? And so forcing yourself to have to, you know, use it or you can't do anything that, that mm -hmm. kind of makes it real for you, you know? Yeah. It, and it, and it makes you remember what it's like to start over. Yeah. And that's kind of some of the reasons why I did it, like starting fresh on a device that you, you knew nothing about. It, it kind of brings back that whole like opening a, a box and having fun. Um, you know, you kind of, you kind of lose that when you open, you know, over a couple hundred computers or something over and over and over. Um, so yeah. it's a good way to revamp and, and find another love for it. Um, you know, some things are, are really weird when you switch operating systems, some things that you just, you're so used to doing things for so long that when you switch, it's just, why would they do that? Um, for instance, yeah. like on Windows, the close button's on the top right, but on Macintosh, it's on the top left. Um, Linux actually is on the top left, but you can sometimes adjust it and switch it over to the right. So there's ways to make it more comfortable to you. Um, some things you just yeah. might have to live with. Um, maybe there's a reason why it's set up that way. Um, so right. experimenting is the big, I, big way to learn. I agree with you that Linux Mint is really uh, the flavor that is most like Windows. Um, for, for people that, that know Windows but want to start messing around with Linux, I, I think that's a great uh, distro to, to use. Have you ever seen um, Dream Linux? I haven't. Um, it, it looks exactly like a Mac. Oh, really? You know, where, where Mint, yeah, Mint looks just like Windows. Dream Linux looks just like a Mac. And mm -hmm. um, it's got the dock across the bottom, you know, and it, it looks just like it. Huh. So um, I, 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 I think they may not be doing any updates on that or anymore, doing any development, but I do know it's still out there. Why? But I it, it is. Another one that's like uh, Windows a lot, kind of like Mint, um, is the Parrot operating system, which is fairly new. Um, it's actually making a lot of paveway um, or headway, and it's kind of like a blend between uh, Linux Mint and Linux Kali. So, oh, really? Yeah, it's a really good I one. I haven't to, seen that one at all. Yeah, I've only heard about it for so long. Um, I know there was another one. Um, there's so many different distributions, but there's one that you can run different oh, I know. shells um, based on the different versions of Linux. So if one doesn't work, then you can switch over and use like from Debian into a different version. Um, so there's there's tons of different ways that you can do it. Um, there's no written rules saying you have to go with Linux or Kali. You don't have to go with Ubuntu, you can choose whatever fits your needs. Yeah. So we'll try. I, I appreciate your doing both sessions, actually, you know, giving us like an intro yesterday. And then uh, for people who were more interested to come back and look, do a deeper dive, so to speak, um, on, on the security end of things. And so I really appreciate your sessions and, and I'll let you go. All right. I appreciate you for having me and everything. Um, I hope you guys have a good one. Okay. Thanks a lot, man.